screens. There you go. Right. Okay, we are now recording, Mr. Carey. All right, I'll call this special meeting of the Board of Education to order. It's 6.32 p.m. Mr. Rell, will you please lead us? Mayor Rell, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I'll be happy to. Thank you. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic, republic of which it stands one, one, one nation, nation under God, God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. All right, before we send over the presentation to Mr. Emmett and Mr. Kazak, I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. It's our first budget workshop of three. Um, the chair of the finance, Mr. Michaels and I, after last year's budget workshops, got some feedback and we decided that it was best to add public comment at the end. So we're excited about that new feature and I know it's a little different, we're using Zoom, but we're hoping it goes smoothly to let the public comment on what they've heard and what their th thoughts are on our budget before we uh, vote on it in a couple weeks. I also wanna thank Councilman Hill for, for coming to our meeting, Mayor Rell and Deputy Mayor Mazzarello, thank you for coming. And there's a lot of administrators here. I will not call everyone out by name, but I appreciate everyone coming on this Wednesday evening mm -hmm. to uh, attend our budget workshop and to be here for questions. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Emmett. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kerry. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, you know, obviously, the budget process is one that is uh, rather arduous and detailed. Um, we have a uh, presentation for you this evening that will be split uh, among myself as well as Mr. Kazaka. In addition to that, I'm proud to have our administrative team here as well um, to be able to answer any questions that you have. Um, obviously, as you all know, um, as of March of last year, things changed pretty dramatically with regard to uh, life as we know it. Um, so we have certainly had some major challenges with regard to uh, getting through this pandemic. Um, again, I think our, our budgeting has been fiscally responsible, uh, certainly was last year. We ended up finishing the fiscal year under budget and we're currently uh, forecast to be under budget again this year. So as we look forward to next year, we're clearly looking at maintaining the services that we uh, provide our students, um, adding some additional services that we feel we need, and uh, still balancing that with knowing we have economic times that are somewhat un uncertain. Uh, you know, we did learn today with the governor's proposed budget of uh, getting uh, stable municipal aid that includes educational aid. That's good news. Um, we've also learned recently that uh, we are going to be in receipt of uh, ESSER II funds, the Elementary and Secondary Schools Relief Act funding. Um, so we're certainly looking to be able to utilize that funding to support our students. Um, it's going to be critically important. So um, we are requesting a total of 58 million seven, uh, 437, uh, 718. So again, 58 million 437,718 dollars in the proposed budget. This represents an increase of 2.7% over the current operating budget. Uh, that is a dollar figure of $1,534,959. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Kazaka. He will provide you with an update on some of the budget drivers and factors. So Mr. Kazaka, ready to share, Thank go you. ahead. Okay, how's that look? Everyone got it? Good, Matt. Okay. I'm just going to go through a brief presentation. We'll discuss some drivers and factors at the macro level, and then we can get into the detailed document and a little Q&A. As Mr. Abbott mentioned, the budget request for next year is just over $58 million, 2.7%. Our salaries and benefits for next year comprise just over 83% of the total budget, which is an increase from the current percentage, a little over 1% increase in that area. And then the non-salary accounts would be the inverse of that. Those are decreasing to just under 17% of the total budget request. Getting into salaries, Total salaries are increasing 2.6%, $986,000. And this is 64% of the total 
$1.5 million increase. Teacher salaries are at 2.43%, just under 660,000. And this is based on current staffing, contractual obligations, and we are also including uh, teacher pay for an extended school year enrichment program to occur after this academic year is over. We are also including two new supervisor positions. These are critically important and the district is, has been lacking in these administrative positions for several years. We're looking at a curriculum supervisor and a special education supervisor. So that accounts for an almost 30% increase when we look at the detail for the supervisor account. Getting into benefits, overall benefits are increasing just over 10%, 930,000, and that would be about 61% of the total $1.5 million increase. Health insurance assumes a 2% premium, premium increase. This was after discussion with Mike O'Neill, the town finance director, and that is much better than our current budget, which had assumed a 12.5% premium increase. When looking at the budget detail, the health insurance line appears to increase $716,000, 14%. That is due to uh, using our 1920 budget savings to offset the 2021. So really using that 2% premium increase, we're looking at a 1.6% increase when you factor in that 625 we used from the previous year's budget savings. Again, the health insurance, which I just mentioned, 716,000, that would represent almost 47% of the total budget increase of 1.5 million. Uh, our defined benefit account is increasing 15%, 202,000. And these are actuarial determined values for the employer pension contribution on the defined benefit plan. And then also the OPEB for uh, retirees. We have our other pension defined contribution. This was enacted, I believe, in 2012 13 for anyone hired as of that date through the current time period. And there's a 4.5% match on salaries for those individuals. That's increasing just under 11%. Getting into some of our other object categories uh, purchase professional and technical services decreasing 8%, about $81,000. This is just based on anticipated costs related to several accounts, including uh, contracted pupil services and our legal services as well. Purchased property services are decreasing a very immaterial amount, $8,000, based on anticipated uh, costs for instructional repairs and maintenance. Other purchased services, this is a large account, it's decreasing just under 4%, about $300,000 based on projected special education tuition and transportation. I just wanna mention here that this is a little bit of an aggressive um, budget amount for next year. We're hoping for a larger state reimbursement on the excess cost piece. We're doing that in order to fund those two uh, supervisor positions. Other purchase services also includes increases for our VOTEC Bo, transportation and tuition. This is based on enrollment. We've discussed throughout our financials this year that we had a new route that was not budgeted, again, based on uh, enrollment that happened late in last year after the budget was settled and throughout the summer. And we also have some new software and licenses due to curricular demands. And Sarah Harris has provided a detail for that amount and I can forward that to the board in the Friday update. Going through the remainder of our major object codes, supplies are decreasing just under 4% based on historical costs and projections for instructional supplies and textbooks. Technology supplies are increasing $45,000. This is really to align with our past purchases and what's necessary for next year. We had reduced the 2021 budget for technology supplies, $50,000 based on the town council overall allocation. This is one of the accounts that we reduced. Same with our property, which is also our technology equipment that's increasing $40,000. Again, we had reduced this based on our overall allocation. And frankly, both of those are insufficient with that reduction. So we need to get them back up to an appropriate level for a district this size. 
And just looking at a few graphics here, you can see salaries and benefits comprising 83% of the total budget request. The green slice there, that's our other purchase services that has all the tuition and the transportation and the software and licenses. That's another large object co code for the district. Here we're pretty steady with our salaries and benefits. You can see we're we've been in the mid, well, we're increasing to the mid 60s from the low 60s over several years, but no large jumps year to year. Non salary accounts, pretty stable as well. Looking back at 17, 18 actual, we had a very large year for special education, tuition, and transportation. So that's where you see the 14.47%. Other than that, we've been stable in the 13s. And again, the projection for next year at 12 and a half percent, we're getting a little aggressive with the excess cost reimbursement, reimbursement from the state. So that's how we've reduced it under 13%. Looking at DERG D for all the towns that comprise uh, DERG D, looking at the mean per pupil versus WPS and the gap is getting a little bit uh, extended between the two, but we're, we're certainly not at the bottom of the dirt, but you can see the mean is 17.7 per student and Weathersfield is at just under 16.5. And this goes back to 1819. The 1920 data is not on the state site, so we're not gonna attempt to do our own calculation. Matt, wouldn't the gap be getting smaller there? From, from 17.18, the gap is like, 2200 or 1200 and then the next year it's not third okay i did the math right yeah it, it's a very small amount but yeah it did increase okay here's looking at our historical budget increases and we had uh, 16 17 17 18 were very lean years but the last few years we've been pretty stable 297 35 and 35 is when we net out the custodial maintenance shift and 205 is our current year. We're going to look at some health insurance increases and we ascended up the mountain over the last few years and looks like we're falling off the cliff here. Hopefully that will remain as we go through February, and March and we get some updated projections. And just a little bit of an overlay between the two. That's it for the presentation. So we want to get into the detail. If you have any specific questions. Any board members have specific questions before we go into the detail, no, which is I, my favorite I, part I, of the whole presentation? Yes, Bobby. Um, we're, we're assuming that the schools are all back operational in September. Correct. Yep, everything was budgeted based on five days a week, 180 days, no okay. remote, no hybrid. Okay. Great. Yeah, just anyone piece else with, with yeah, just I want to add with the piece with the remote at this point in time, uh, the state does allow the remote learning option. Um, we don't know for sure if that's going to extend <laughs> into next year at this juncture. So I think it's really going to depend upon how well we do with vaccinations into the spring and the summer. Chuck. Yes, go ahead, Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if this is the right time to ask this question, Chuck. So if it, if it isn't, we can do it later. But Michael, I was hoping sure. you could give us kind of a description, and again, if it's a bit more appropriate later, of the need for the two new positions, the curriculum supervisor and the special ed supervisor. And Chuck, again, if this is better done later, uh, that's okay too. No, it's perfect time. No, I, I'd be happy to provide that update. You know, we, uh, several years back, we had uh, two positions in the curriculum office, um, instructional supervisor for math and an instructional supervisor for reading. And uh, these folks provided um, support to curriculum specialists as well as teachers in the classroom. And uh, 
some of these past budget years, Matt showed you the, um, the graph. We had that, you know, a couple of years where we were really, really tight. We had the reduction in uh, ECS funding. So we ended up losing those positions. And, uh, you know, it, it's been difficult, especially in this pandemic where you're developing new learning models and you're really having to be very innovative. Um, and we've been lean there. On the special education side, um, I started my career in Weathersfield as the director of special services back in 2008. And we had a prevalence rate of special education of just around 10%. And uh, at this point in time, we've seen that prevalence rate uh, rise rather dramatically. And uh, John or Liz, I know you're on the, the um, meeting tonight. Rough and tough, where are we at right now with our identification rate? So 14 and approaching 15. So you've seen a pretty significant rise in the number of special ed students. Um, and I do want to say with John and Liz, John and Liz are case managers, not only for our students here in the Weathersfield Public Schools, but students that are attending out of district placements, uh, students that are attending magnet schools uh, and receiving special ed services. They have a tremendous number of students for which they are responsible. In addition to that, you know, um, several years back, the board charged us with looking for ways to reduce the number of students that we had going out to out of district placements. Hence, we have expanded our ABA program, uh, Applied Behavior Analysis for our students with autism from a program that was just at the early elementary level, uh, like pre-KK, all the way up now from pre-K through grade six. And what we've done is we've avoided having to send students out to high cost out of district placements that included uh, sizable transportation costs. And we've also increased the number of programs in house with regard um, to our trauma informed students, our students with special needs in the area of uh, behavior and social emotional uh, needs. So we've developed the STRIVE program. Uh, we have a human relations program at uh, Silas Dean Middle School. And each of these programs supports keeping our kids in district. Um, the reality here is that these programs need to be administered, uh, they need to be uh, monitored, they need to be supported. And we've gotten to the point now where, you know, we've had John and Liz running this um, department and they're getting spread thin. Uh, in fact, at this point this year, we've utilized Donna Schulke, a retired uh, administrator and one that has worked with us as an interim principal, uh, just to, um, attend some of the PPT meetings uh, and take some of the pressure off from uh, Liz and John. From the curriculum side, you know, I'd certainly defer to Sally at this point in time. And, you know, Sally, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the impact that a, 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 a instructional supervisor would have in the curriculum department, It'd be much appreciated. Go ahead. Yeah, we have a need to support curriculum, um, as Mr. Emmett said, as we come out or, or continue to live through this pandemic and the changes in learning models and the, um, the shift and the, the, really the change in educational philosophy that's occurring and will continue to occur. Um, right now, our recommendation is uh, as a focus on the secondary level for curriculum in this reader. Um, our secondary schools do not have curriculum specialists, uh, coaches, um, and so as far as improving instruction and being expert in that area, um, our building administrators, curriculum department, um, some, some ways to help support teachers. Um, so to support that proposal, um, we have recommendations from the NEASP report. Um, actually, at our next board meeting, we'll be uh, hearing a presentation from Winfield High School. Um, in that presentation, it speaks to a uh, five-year curriculum revision cycle that we have not been able to meet, um, changing in instructional practices to support student-centered learning, um, and the need to make some um, continued improvement in curriculum at the secondary level. Um, so that person, uh, this uh, supervisor, would be uh, focusing primarily on the secondary level. Um, if I had my magic wand, we would be asking for more than one. That uh, does not mean that we don't have the same need at the elementary level, but I think the secondary does not have any coaching positions or additional people uh, to support in the curriculum pieces. Um, surrounding districts, um, I don't think I know of any district um, our size um, in the area that doesn't have additional administrators supporting uh, curriculum and instruction. Um, and, you know, we are faced with um, our students having interrupted learning for the last year. 
and possibly for longer than a year, um, interrupted learning. And so as we work to make sure that our time in the classroom is the most efficient um, and produces um, exceptional growth for our students, um, we have a great need to help improve learning and engage students um, and shift our focus so that all students um, are successful in the classroom. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael and Sally. Thanks, Chuck. No problem. Any other questions before we hit the uh, ground running in our budget packet? Elaine, yes. Um, Mike and um, Mr. Kazar and Elizabeth, have we considered starting, just thoughts here, on uh, part-time, 0.5 special education supervisor, is it called special ed supervisor? I mean, we may have to start small. I don't know, Michael, we'll come to that down the budget. Have you guys in your little inner circle talked about that maybe we can't get full-time, we'll get half-time or whatever percent? Yeah, I don't... yeah, it's a good question, Elaine. And you know, I think that what you've seen over the past several years is we've really tried to think outside the box and be creative. Yeah. And you know, there's one other um, avenue I'd certainly like to explore within this budget and it's not contained within the budget, but that is, you know, working with CREC on uh, a teacher residence program uh, to increase the uh, number of staff members we have in district, uh, staff members of color. Um, that is an opportunity that I've shared with you before. Um, and, you know, again, we do tend to see retirements. I'd love to be able to reinvest some of the savings from the retirements to yep. be able to participate in that CREC teacher residency. From a standpoint of finding a 0.5, I think the one challenge we're gonna find here, Elaine, is a position such as that to get a 0.5, you're really gonna be relying upon likely somebody who's retired and is just looking for part-time, uh, you know, as opposed to somebody that's looking for that full-time with, with the benefit package as well. Um, we certainly stand ready to, um, to be as flexible as we possibly can be, but I'd certainly like to be able to pro um, provide some support to our special services I, absolutely. our schools. Thank you, Elaine. And I could just add, we've uh, you know looked at this and tried to address it uh, the past couple of years. And I just have to talk about the uh, work, especially with specialized programs. And I'm gonna look over at Liz because the job that she's doing with the ABA program, she's making that program a model for the state. And with that, now that we're running up to 20, that's taking a lot of her time really to focus in on that program. And on top of that, we still have to cover all the other schools, all the other programs, and we didn't even talk about the uh, classroom at the middle school. So uh, Barbara Wood has developed a classroom really okay. for some of our students that have needs. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot. And it's like tooting your own home, horn. It's hard to ask for things yourself. But, uh, you know, I think we have a program and a department that's second to none. Uh, but it is difficult. Yeah, okay. I, I would say, John, just, you know, to add on the other aspect here, it was mentioned earlier in the presentation by Matt, we were talking about the uh, summer school opportunity for kids. You know, one of the things we want to do here within this budget is be able to provide kids the opportunity to, you know, address any learning loss that's happened. And um, what we have always done, board members, you know this, I know council, you know as well, we've always provided an extended year program uh, for our students with special needs. Um, that is, you know, our legal obligation. And that is a program that John and Liz have helped to oversee and to build uh, very nicely over the past several years. So that's something that happens even in the summertime. They are over at Webb School all summer long providing support to our special ed teachers, our families, our students, and our support staff. Anyone else? Matt, oh, where's Matt? Matt's not on my screen, there he is. Matt, is there a way to quantify how much we're saving by having these programs that we created and expanded on? We can look at it. I, we did it, I believe, the first year that we implemented the programs and maybe even the second year, and it was significant. We're talking several hundred thousand dollars, and I would guess in excess of a million dollars at this time, but we haven't done the exercise in, I think, two fiscal years. Okay, and is this special ed supervisor a new position or are we replacing one that's been cut before? Uh, I don't know if there was a second position. In my five years, we've only had one supervisor. That's correct. Okay. And I believe, uh, Mr. Carey, that it was part of the proposal when we um, in, um, added additional programs. I believe it was part of the second year proposal because of the addition of new programs. So it, it has been requested before. 
Okay, thank you. Anyone else with questions? When we talk about the secondary supervisor, I'll keep going. Are, are we looking, so we, I know eight years ago, we transformed the leadership team at the high school and made it a halftime AD, halftime principal. Would it be more behooving to go back to our model that we had 10 years ago, where we had a full-time AD and brought in another administrator to help with the curriculum and instructional practices at the high school? Michael, Sally, anyone who wants to answer, any other administrators at the high school? Just I think that's a great thing we can go back and discuss. I don't think I have a quick answer for you because you got me thinking, but I think it's something we could go back and discuss most definitely. Yep. And if we can look at how many schools our size and around that still have full-time ADs, I'd appreciate that. I know Mr. Maltesi probably has that or could get it easy. Well, I have my hats off to him for all he does, I'll tell you. Oh, I tell him that all the time when I see him. He does an incredible <laughs> well, job. I can't see him anymore. <laughs> and it, so Matt, could you go and talk about technology, property, and supplies? You talked about that being cut. And can we look more in more detail of what that is? So it's a, equipment, which is replacement of devices, emergency replacement, if there's a need for special education students may need devices, that's the account it comes from. And really we have, we're typically around 90 to $100,000 on an annual basis and 50 for this year is really insufficient for a district this size. So we're getting back to historical levels and that's the same with supplies as well. We had cut that 50,000 last year and there's a, a large amount of items that fall under technology supplies. So we can certainly explore the detail for the next workshop if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, Matt, if I may, I, I do have members of the IT team on uh, this evening. I see uh, Jeff Telke, Jim DeRegan, and I believe Sarah Harris is on as well. Um, can you guys provide a little bit of, of detail? Jim, I see you coming on. Go ahead, yeah, Jim. Yes, and I can speak a little more to this as far as uh, you know all the subsystems that the uh, IT department supports, uh, whether it's servers, devices, iPads, Chromebooks, it is PA systems, it is um, camera systems, servers, all of these different subsystems we manage daily and we do it ourselves. We don't rely on any outside vendors. So the big thing we need is replacement parts on these. And since we manage them all ourselves, we do require a fair amount of equipment um, to manage all of these different subsystems. And with the uh, expansion of our one-to-one -one program, um, which is wonderful because it, it ensures uh, digital equity for all of our students and accessibility for all of our students, which we know is incredibly important, especially now. Um, it also means that we have more devices out in the hands of students. We have more devices in our classrooms uh, being used by teachers for, at this time, both instruction and uh, providing remote instruction. Um, and so, so that does inherently lead to uh, more devices needing to be replaced or repaired just by sheer numbers. So as we look to next year, we do anticipate that one-to-one -one will continue. Um, and with that, we will continue to need to make sure we have replacement devices to get right into the hands of kids and teachers should a device fail or need repair. Thank you, Sarah. Would this include the smart boards in this line, in these line items? That may fall under supplies if there's components needed for any repairs. Yeah. Tech team, I know at one point in time we were um, involved in developing a plan to replace uh, projectors for smart boards. I know a couple of years back I was petitioned by a group of friends from Charles Wright School in a classroom uh, that was desperate for a new projector. We were able to provide that. Have we continued to do that to the extent we can? We are moving forward with that. Uh, COVID came along and disrupted some of our long-term plans, but we're getting back to that now. Our main focus uh, since uh, March uh, has been to uh, get devices in students' hands, get that one-to-one -one initiative really going along. So we are moving back towards that, Michael, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other board members with questions, comments? 
All right, Matt, you want to move into some details? Yeah, looking at the budget draft there, the first few pages are essentially what was in the presentation there, just highlighting some of the drivers and the factors at a high level. I don't think there's anything on page two or three that was not in the presentation. Um, then the next several pages are our major object categories, your salaries, your benefits, other purchase services, supplies, and this has four years of actuals along with our current budget and the next year request. And then we get into the real detail with Munis and every single employee, all the different repair accounts, supply accounts, licenses and fees. Um, I know we really went through the analysis on licenses and fees last year. And I mentioned we have an increase of about $45,000 for next year. And I can provide all that detail. Sarah had sent it to me previously. It's not in the budget draft, but I can put that either in the Friday update for Mr. Emmett or we can have it at the next workshop. And then beyond the Munis detail, we have uh, our revenue offset for the budget. And then we also have a current year reforecast that compares our projection for this June to next year's budget request. I don't think it's a good use of our time to really go have me read through the detail of Munis or read through any detail. So if there's any questions, just let me know, reference the page and we can try it that way. From your presentation, the non-salary line of special ed tuition. Yeah. In the bar graph, it looked like you said we've been staying stable, but I thought all of last year we were running over in that account by a lot until COVID hit. We, that is correct. I will have to look at our comparison for budget versus actual because that is not in this sheet. So let me write that down for you, Chuck. Any other questions? We're a quiet group when we're online. Yeah. It's usually, usually more feisty when we're in person. Yes, Bobby. Sally, a question for you. We got, um, I think twice, uh, Karen has called in to talk about the students having enough credits as the state requires us to have more. Are we gonna be okay with that? I mean, we're gonna have enough social studies credits. I guess, I think that was the issue that was brought up. Yeah, Bobby, that's a great question. Um, I did provide an uh, update for Michael and he'll be putting it in your Friday packet uh, around that. I've been meeting with the department um, and discussing different options. Um, that department has not lost staff. Um, I looked back either five or six years ago and they have the same number of uh, teachers in their department. Um, you know, we always have students that um, would like to take more courses than we, than we can offer. Um, but um, that coupled with the new graduation requirements, mm -hmm. and we've also looked uh, creatively with the help of Nisco and Tyler Webb, um, looked at class size of our electives, but also um, how we um, could sustain, not sustain, but we wanna be able to provide a full credit of social studies for our ninth grade students next year, and we'll be able to do that. Um, and then it wouldn't have a big hit on our electives in the upper grades. Um, there will be a few, you know, less sections on some of our electives that may have five or six sections, and maybe they might have one month section. Um, but I think through um, the power of our scheduler, um, we've identified some ways to not have significant changes on that department. Um, so uh, Michael does have an update. Um, it includes um, um, surrounding towns, or actually around Connecticut. Um, the 
all of them have a full credit of social studies in ninth grade. So we're moving back to that model um, and have met with the department about curriculum and um, have some ongoing conversations. So we're still in the process, but uh, Michael has an update as to what we've shared with the department. And so I think um, I can tell you that there will not be a significant impact on our um, upper grade electives, small, but you know, every year we offer different electives and different enrollment. Um, so that coupled with a larger, um, larger kind of what I call bucket for graduation. So there'll be um, this coming junior class will have a um, nine credit uh, requirement of humanities. So that includes our art, our music, um, English, social studies, and so students will be able to choose courses within that bucket. Um, so we are confident that we will be able to make this change without having significant impact on um, electives for our seniors and seniors. Thank you. Michael or Matt, have we looked at enrollment projections for next year and how are we for teachers? K-12, especially in the elementary schools for class sizes. Are we gonna right be now, staying stable? Yeah, right now, Chuck, we're looking at, at a level of stability. Um, one of the things we are gonna be taking a look at obviously is um, kindergarten. That's one thing that does pique our interest. You know, we're interested in understanding, you know, did we have parents that held their kids out uh, that were eligible for kindergarten? So that's gonna be one area we're definitely gonna take a look at. Um, the number of sections that we have at Highcrest, obviously, you know, Siobhan could attest to the fact that Highcrest is the uh, largest uh, enrolled school right now at this point in time. Uh, we see that continuing. I think also from a perspective of real estate, uh, the real estate market has been pretty robust in, in Weathersfield. We certainly are seeing families move in. So um, I'm not seeing a, a projection of a large number of students moving out. The other thing that I want to make sure everybody knows is with your approval last night of moving forward with phase three, uh, Malone and McBroom is going to be doing an update of their enrollment projections over the next 10 years. So we'll be looking to get that data um, later on this spring and into the summer. So, um, you know, stability has been the name of the game here in Wethersfield. So we expect that to continue. Any other board members? Yeah, I just have a quick question. I don't know if this is the appropriate time to do it, but um, you know, one thing that that I think we've all talked about, and, and and if it's been covered, I apologize for bringing it up again. But given what we've had to endure, like all school systems and parents around the country, with uh, our learning model and kids being obviously not completely in school all the time and the suspension of a lot of our testing and measuring models. What are we looking at and, and should we be looking at funding to evaluate the impact of COVID? If we, let's just say, we hope and pray that in September that you know, we're, we're back without masks and we're in school and, and this you know, horrible moment in our history has passed. Uh, how, do we, how are we gonna be prepared to evaluate a competency and, and, and you know, the Apple, you know, the just general uh, acumen of our students, how are we going to measure that? And, and then what, how are we going to, you know, pay for that evaluation or how are we going to deal with that? Or, or, or is that just something we just are, haven't thought through yet? Or we are, I'm assuming you're thinking through it. I mean, I assume some of that guidance is going to come from the state, I would imagine, and maybe state resources, but uh, I just throw that out there. Yeah, it's a very good point, Chris. And, you know, we've done obviously some benchmark data with the STAR assessments in each of the schools. I shared with that data with you back in December, and you could definitely see some gaps. That is something that all of our principals are monitoring carefully, even now. Um, with regard to the SBAC, we are getting prepared for that. Uh, right now, the state is looking to administer the SBAC. Um, and uh, we just had a conversation with our principals about that earlier this week. So, um, we're not looking at getting a lot of heavy duty data out of that. I think the SBAC is going to tell us what we know, that we're going to have an achievement gap. It's a reality and we're going to have to work to close that achievement gap. Um, I think we've had kids that have been able to roll along and not be impacted by the pandemic. And then I have other kids, you know, again, I shared with you the, the DNF list at the secondary right. level. It was yeah. concerning to, to me and, uh, 
Yeah, we're, we're going to definitely have to look at ways of assessing where kids are at. Also, um, Chris, I would say with the social emotional impact, you know, I can give them a test and I can get a, a grade on that test, but I also need to look at it from the perspective of, you know, socialization. And think about it, going back to Monday, I, I saw kindergartners in classrooms that had not seen some of their classmates ever other than being on a computer screen. So there's a lot of work to be done around, you know, developing strong social skills for kids. And that's another thing we're gonna to have to look at. And I think um, as we dig into the um, ESSER funds, that'll be some supplemental um, uh, ideas there that we'll put into play to provide programming for kids and supports. I guess my other point, thank you, Mike, for that answer. And, and I realize that that no, no one has the answer just yet. And, and I know you're doing everything you can to measure that. I know the teachers are, and certainly the administrators are doing a lot of um, incredible work on that. So, and, and I apologize for my ignorance on these matters, but does there come a point where you have to make an evaluation over the summer where kids have to repeat a grade and what impact that might have on our classroom size and the whole configuration of the school? How does that actually work or I mean, in other words, are we are we have to make those calls rather than, uh, or is the other, or, or is there a benchmark? I mean, uh, uh, other alternatives like you know remedial uh, instruction or any sort of catch up work that that might be needed during the summer. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we're going to need to look at it on a case by case basis. Um, I, for one, am not a huge proponent of retention unless I have real compelling data to support it. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned the remedial piece. One of the things we're looking to do this summer is to broaden our summer school opportunities so that we can, you know, help kids get caught up. Um, obviously, I think the direction of moving kids back into in-person learning, we're starting that process now. Um, again, I think it becomes a case-by-case -case basis. You know, I've had parents that have requested it. Um, and you have to look at the big picture here. It, what, what is the benefit? What are kids going to get out of it? Um, and it's, I think it's gonna be a case by case basis, but I will tell you, I'm, I'm not looking to have a massive number of kids being retained. I need to accelerate the um, instruction in that next grade level. I need to support them with the social emotional and make sure that they have all the materials to close those gaps. Well, I think you agree. I, I'm all for whatever we need to take to promote and to close the gap rather than, and then just promote. Right. Uh, okay. All right. Well, that's good. I, I appreciate the answer and um, obviously supportive of all that. And I think you're right that we don't really know what we don't really know right now. And I would assume that it, that also works with the special education component as well. It does, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other members? Matt, last year we had a big push on ELL and getting more support for them. Where do we stand on that? And I know now we're in the COVID era, so I'm not sure how much support we got. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Sally answer that. Yeah, um, actually we're in the process of developing another five-year plan. Um, our L numbers continue to increase. And if we look back five years ago, um, from our last five-year plan, um, we, they have um, increased at the same rate that we had predicted based upon statewide data. Um, so we are looking to add an additional L teacher next year, um, but we've done that and plan to do that through grant funds that we've allocated towards that for next year. Um, will we be coming forward to you with a five-year plan that will include um, some additional support for teachers, um, you know, moving forward for the next five years. Um, as we talk about caseload um, and, and prevalence rate within special education, uh, we are finding some of the same complexities and rate of growth in, in L. Um, and while we're excited to have seen our department grow over the last five years, um, we know we're bursting at the seams. Um, so we do have a plan in place for one additional teacher, again, by reallocating some of our grant funds, um, existing funding, um, and then we'll bring forward to share with you um, enrollment data, achievement data, and five-year plan. Uh, so for budgeting purposes, you can see the five-year plan versus just one, one year. So that'll be coming in the next few months. Great. Thank you. All right. If there's no other questions. Yes, Bobby. Thank you. I have a, a question for John Carzar, and I'm not sure he remembers. We had a discussion maybe a couple of years ago how difficult it is to tell if a child has special needs or if they're ELL. 
Has there been any new discoveries in that area? I, it's probably well, about three years ago I asked you this. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated because you have to first look at the, um, the L, the language, is that impacting? And uh, one thing that we're really trying to work on is a collaboration between our two departments uh, because, and let me use an example, somebody who may just uh, moved into the uh, United States within the past year. You first have to consider the L issues first and look at how having L services impacting that child. Are they able and making gains through uh, the L services? Or is it sort of a core mor comorbid that it's also part of a special ed issue? Um, and so very complicated. We have found that at many of our uh, schools, we do have a higher uh, prevalence rate amongst L students, which means we probably are over identifying special ed students or over identifying L students also as special ed students. And so that's what we're working carefully on to try to you know, figure out the differences. Yeah. And, and I always tell uh, teachers this, because at first they were like, oh, well, we can't even look at special ed if they just, you know, came into the, you know, United States or they just are learning a language. And no, that's not true. Child find, we always have to consider whether a child is special ed, but we also have to look at that, you know, the dual L and special ed issues. So I don't know if that helps at all, Bobby, or? I was just looking for a magic formula somewhere, I guess. That <laughs> uh, actually, can I say the only magic formula that I found is collaboration. We have to have close talks between the two departments to really determine, uh, is it one, is it the other, or is it both? And then when do we start looking at, um, you know, referral into special ed? Because child find uh, is for all children. Child find is we always have to look to see if a child has a disability, we have to identify them and provide them with appropriate services. Okay, thanks, John. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? All right, Michael, is anyone on the phone? You're muted. Sorry about that. Always do that. Uh, I don't have anybody <laughs> on the phone at this point in time. I have 29 participants total. All right, if we have no other questions, comments right now, if board members can, if you think of any questions, please send them the map and then he can gear his presentation at the next workshop around our questions. And Chuck, I'll have uh, updates as uh, Sally had mentioned, I have her update that'll go in the Friday update. And Matt had a couple of other items uh, so that we'll get into the Friday update uh, for you for your review. Uh, and again, uh, to echo what you said, any questions that you have, um, by all means, send them our way and we'll be happy to answer anything that uh, you have. All right, then we won't keep everyone. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. He said.